Hello and welcome to Stories of Scotland, a podcast where we delve deep into the archives and the outdoors to bring you stories of Scottish history and environment. I'm Annie. And I'm Jenny. And this week we'll be looking at one of my favourite footnotes in Scottish history, Brunard Island. This tiny island is also known as Anthrax Island. And as we found out, Annie, it has a very dark and deadly history. Yes, and I'm really interested in Grunard Island too, because it holds this strange yet alluring dark tourism atmosphere to it. So in this episode, we'll be taking a trip to Grunard and looking at it from the past to the modern times. Now most of what we know about Grunard is from the last two centuries, so we'll be talking about the island as a place of kelp, crofting, clearances and also as a place of deadly anthrax experiments that started in the 1940s. And I can't wait for all this. But right before all that, Annie, the island itself. Grunard Island is an unassuming little lump of rock situated just off the northwest coast of Scotland. And when I say just, I mean just. It's actually surrounded by the mainland on three sides, so it's sort of nestled in this little pocket of coastline. And it's not actually that far away from the populated mainland, is it? Oh, no, no, not at all. It's less than two kilometres from the mainland town of Mungersdale and only 18 kilometres from Ullapool, which is the biggest mainland town pretty much on the northwest coast above Fort William. But no one actually lives on the island itself. It's this small oval shape and it's only about 2.5 kilometres by one kilometre, so you could easily walk around the perimeter in a couple of hours. There is a slight hill on it, and although at the top you're not that high, the view is great as there's not a single tree on the island. It's just covered in heather and grass. Okay, but there's some historical evidence that there used to be trees on this island. Now, I find a description of Grunard Island from the 16th century by a Scottish clergyman named Donald Munro, and he wrote in Descriptions of the Western Isles of Scotland, that the little island of Grunard, no more than a mile long, full of wood, good for the fostering of thieves and rebels, it pertains to Mackenzie. So not only was this island covered in trees, but it was also used as a covert hiding place for thieves and rebels. Ah, yes. Well, this does make sense because there used to be trees all over Scotland. The tree line is about 2,000 foot, so anywhere below that, trees would grow if given the chance. Only we didn't give them the chance. Unfortunately, it's the same story as a lot of the world. As settlements and agriculture took over from the nomadic lifestyle, which was about 5,000 years ago in Scotland, the trees were slowly cut down to make way for agriculture. By the Roman invasion in 82 Common Era, it is thought that half of the native woodland was already gone. By the 19th century, only 5% of Scotland had tree cover. Well, that doesn't leave many places for rebels to hide at all. No, probably the only plus of mass deforestation, Annie. I didn't think there were any pluses of (laughs) mass deforestation. (laughs) Silver linings. (laughs) So, although small... The history of this wee island is really quite involved with rural industries. Grunard Island is overlooked by Grunard Bay, an area where people live and farm, and despite the water, the people on this jagged, rocky piece of coast are very connected to the island. We know that in the late 18th century, there were attempts made to sell the valuable kelp of Grunard Island. Ah, the kelp. I love kelp. It's this wonderful olive green or shiny chestnut coloured seaweed, which was harvested for industries that involved chemical processing, so soap or glass making or linen bleaching at the time. Kelp could be collected from rocky coasts when the tide was out or when it was thrown up or washed ashore after rough weather at sea. In the late 1700s and early 1800s, the kelp industry was booming on the west coast of Scotland. Kelp would be dried out by the sun and then burnt in a kelp kiln, and the substance left behind from the burning had the minerals that the industries wanted. There was a lot of money to be made from kelp in the Western Isles, but unfortunately, it wasn't made by the crofters harvesting it. 
Crofters that turned to kelp burning often had to use weeds like heather and gorse in processing the kelp. These would otherwise have been used to fertilise their own lands for agriculture. Now, the landowners, in classic landowner fashion, took the lion's share of the kelp's profits, leaving crofters worse off. Not only were they not making much money from the kelp, their actual farms were actually being less productive because they weren't able to put the same nutrients into the land. Yes, working on the kelp was very detrimental to crops and agriculture. Now, kelp processing was seasonal work, which actually conflicted with planting and harvesting on the crofts. However, when landowners realised how much money could be made from the kelp, as well as how much money they could get if they used their glens and lands for sheep and wool instead of crofters, then they started really encouraging the people on their land to move closer to the coasts. Mm. Unfortunately, though, the kelp industry was a bubble that was kept afloat by the Napoleonic Wars. Big salty bubble. So the Napoleonic Wars had cut off Britain's access to Spanish Barilla, which was the main alternative to their kelpy chemicals. So when the Napoleonic War finished, the price of kelp crashed. Uh, and this had a tragic impact on crofters. Oh, no. So I found a report in the Perth Courier in 1831 reporting on this very failing industry in the Western Isles. Because of the low price of kelp, the manufacture of it has been of late on the decline and, in many districts, entirely abandoned, by which the landlord is deprived of no small part of his income and the tenants forced from their native soil to wander among the boundless woods of America. Without kelp manufacture or some other labour, the tenants of these small holdings can pay no rent. What then is to become of these poor people? They migrate with their families to the respective portions of kelp shores, sometimes to the distance of 15 miles, where they are biovacked among rocks and insulated islands. It is not uncommon to see kelpers, after 15 hours hard labour, going to sea in the evening, and on their success at fishing depends the following day's subsistence. The wives when cutting the kelp weeds, gather limpets and other such shellfish that may be found. And the tender wee infant may be seen squatted low on kelp weed near his industrious mother. Oh, this is heartbreaking. The Western Isles really suffered from the decline of the kelp industry, and the plummet of kelp is seen as a major factor in the Highland Clearances. Now, the Highland Clearances were the land management decisions made by the elite landowning classes, which resulted in the forced eviction of a great deal of people from the highlands and islands, people who had been living in the highlands for generations and made their lives here. And with the kelp industry, we see families being pushed from crofting to the coasts to work in an industry that's in its own bubble. And when this industry bursts, they don't have the traditional agricultural systems to fall back on. This has already been replaced with flocks of sheep. Now this truly devastated communities, tearing people from their roots, often who had worked land in an area for generations and whose relationship with this land was so precious that it was really embedded in their culture. I saw a really touching quote when researching this, that a crofter was speaking about the lairds, so that's the landowners, and he said, Lairds, they come buy, sell land, they pass away, but the humble crofter remains on his land still. So it gives us this idea that the crofter's relationship with the land is one that's, that's passed on throughout families and one that's everlasting. But unfortunately, this wasn't going to continue. Yeah, this was a very hard time for tenant crofters and they would often be left with very little choice. To ensure the survival of their families, they either had to move to the slums of one of the overcrowded industrial cities or sail across the Atlantic to the faraway lands of North America. So the place of Grunard as a mainland estate and Grunard Island itself were impacted by the clearances. Many families were left with no option but to leave. We'll see as we go on that this island continues to have some terrible fortune. So, a 
although small, we see many diverse uses of Grunard Island. At different times, it was used for fishing, hunting, and as a grazing pasture for sheep. And it was inhabited by people in these industries. For example, in the Inverness Courier in 1838, we learn that there was... Melancholic occurrence. Five men drown. It is with deep regret that we record the following accident by which five men have lost their lives in the Bay of Grunard, Rorschach. On Tuesday the 17th, Mr Hogg, earlier at Meikle River of Grunard, with four men, went out in a small boat to bring in Mr Young, manager of the Ardross Fishing, and Donald Fraser, fox hunter, who had gone to the island of Grunard to look after the sheep of Mr Mackenzie of Ardross and had been storm-stayed in the island for some days. The weather was most inclement. The wind blew a hurricane and the showers of drift and snow were excessive. The boat had proceeded only a short way from the shore when it was upset and the whole crew were precipitated overboard. In a short time, the lifeless bodies of the five men were washed ashore on the beach. A touching and melancholy spectacle. Oh, wow. So... While this tells us that at one point, yes, Grunard was used for sheep grazing, it also shows us just how dangerous and treacherous Grunard was as a place, even for these locals who knew the area well. With these vast and powerful storms blowing over the land and the sea and just sweeping up this tiny island in them, five men is a big loss for the local community. Even just from this passage, you can see how well and interconnected they all would have been. This was such a tragedy, Annie. Yes, the local community really would have felt the pain of this. But I was also interested that it was talking about sheep grazing. Because just a year before this incident, it had been reported that a parcel of Cheviot sheep heading to Grunard Island were brutally interfered with. They were stolen, slaughtered, and there were even reports of their ears being cut off close to the bone so that the sheep couldn't be identified. Oh, what? why? Well, the Cheviot sheep is a hardy breed of sheep that has become very symbolic of the clearances. Okay. Now, landlords made more money from having sheep on their land than tenants, so people were evicted and replaced with sheep, and it's really clear that Grignard landowners were not very popular in the local community, with people even cutting their fishing nets as a way to show hostility a kind of localised act of rebellion. Wow, that sounds really grim to have to be pushed to those extremes on your own land. But did it cheer up for the folks of Grunard at all, you know, when they they weren't drowning or or stealing sheep or cutting their own nets? Well, this genuinely baffles me. In the midst of the potato famine in the 1840s, all of the tenants of Letterhue and Grunard were invited to a regatta by the landowner, Merrick Banks, who showed them his yacht and ran some sailing competitions for them and also told his tenants that they should spend every spare hour fishing. So he spoke of the disastrous potato crops and then said he didn't want his tenants feeding upon porridge for nothing, but he obviously didn't care that much because otherwise he would have given them some relief and some some food as opposed to just telling them to catch more fish. All right, well, you know, it sounds like he's got good and bad sides. You know, he puts on a nice regatta for his, for his people. Not at all, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> These were people who were tirelessly working on his land for his profit, mm. and they were starving. The conditions that people were living in were so bad that they were forced to emigrate to an uncertain future and that's if he hadn't already evicted them. But then he decides to hold a regatta, <laughs> as if this helps anything. For me, this represents the chasm of difference between the landowning lairds and the tenants who work the land. Yeah, I, I guess it is really difficult to actually paint in your mind what these kind of events would be like. Uh, the 1800s, yes, were through and through very rough for rural tenants. But I guess I was thinking that they might at least find a speckle of joy in a regatta, you know, a nice day off the croft. But uh, but when you put it like that, I can see how the landowner showing off his big and expensive yacht 
may not exactly have provided a feeling of warmth when the same man is letting them starve and evicting them from their homes. Can actually more like is the cheek of it, you know? I can just imagine him standing on the side of this huge yacht, like, look at my yacht! Oh, isn't it so nice <laughs> and big and shiny? Bet you haven't seen anything like this before, eh? <laughs> what a treat for you all! Gosh, why don't you come on, come up here, stand aboard? Yes, feel the quality. How lucky are you? How kind am I? <laughs> what, what, why are you all booing? Is that, oh, is that sheep poo? Oh, God, you, un, you ungrateful swine. Off, off my land. Oh, well, that is the last time I try to connect to my subjects. Or something along those lines. <laughs> what have we discussed about improv, Jenny? <laughs> I can't help it, this guy. He's just... <laughs> so, though that may not be exactly what he said, <laughs> Banks was a notoriously unpleasant landowner. People on his land were living in such awful conditions that they were even afraid to make repairs on their own homes, afraid that he would put up their rents because the improved quality of housing could demand a higher rate. Wow, that is outrageous, Annie. And then in 1860, we read in the Inverness Advertiser that... Besides, these poor tenants have to pay 12 months in advance. Why is it then that the proprietor of the soil acts towards the people in the manner that he does, evicting them from their houses and small holdings in weather unprecedentedly stormy and such an inclement season of the year, and literally without any shelter for their aged and infirm, or for their women and tender little ones, except caves hollowed out of the rocky, roughy inshore by the stormy billows of this wide Atlantic. The only reason we could ascertain is too common in the Highlands, the enlargement of sheep farms. Okay, so it doesn't sound like it can get much worse for Oof. these people. However, oh. I've looked up these <laughs> caves that people sought for shelter that this article is speaking about. And one of them is just along the coast, on the mainland of Grunard Bay. A cave called Pollacher Cave in Sand. And Merrick Banks actually evicted a widow, Isabella Mackenzie, from this cave in 1862, where she had been living out of sheer desperation. I cannot believe that this landowner would evict a widow from a cave. This is, this is horrific. Like, what is he thinking? Oh, she was in a cave. How terrible. That's my cave. That's my air she's breathing in there. My air is the air to that air. How dare she breathe the air that's my air's air's out, out of this cave, you ungrateful turnip eater. Oh, well, these people never understand the birthrights of air. Jenny, this is a heartbreaking episode. Why do you choose now to bring in improv? Because it's so sad. <laughs> well, it's especially sad because... No. <laughs> I can't take any more. It's especially sad oh. because these caves had been a place of sanctuary. The larger cave next to where Isabella sheltered had been used for church services. Oh, Annie. It was a really significant place for the people of this wee area, and it's utterly heartbreaking to imagine the conditions that these crofters were forced into. But later, we come to see Grunard Island itself used as a playing piece in the Highland Clearances. Oh. So here's a document from the Northern Ensign in 1888. Threat and raid in Russia. The small tenants of the Dundonald estates have communicated with the Edinburgh agent of the estates, stating that they have unanimously determined to get the farm of Monkcastle and the island of Grunard. In the communication, the crofters say, They are able to take the farm so that they will not be so crowded and packed in such useless, bad ground as at present. We really decide. The document proceeds that half of the people should go where there are plenty of good ground. They think the factor should arrange with them at once about the matter, as they declare they cannot live on their small crofts, 
when there is plenty and to spare in the neighbourhood. Grunard belongs to the Dundonald estate. To meet the emergency, the Alt B constable has been recalled to his own district. He will be assisted in the meantime by one or two of the new constables. Arrangements were also being made whereby one of the gunboats on the Lewis coast will be brought to this side of the Minch. Now, this genuinely shocked me that the authorities were considering getting a gunboat to protect Grunard Island from the crofters. I mean, bear in mind, the crofters aren't asking for an excessive piece of land here. Grunard Island is really small. I mean, how big is it? Oh, it's less than two kilometres squared. It's, it's tiny. It's just very upsetting to think that the crofters were willing to pin all of their dreams on such a small piece of land. And yet the authorities were prepared to defend it with a gunboat. It's just, it's, it's very surreal. Um, but I think that the story of Grunard Island during the 1800s from the Cheviot sheep to the people just wanting it to be a piece of crofting land, it highlights how thorough and brutal the Highland clearances were. So we've talked a lot about Grenard Island, but what about Anthrax Island, Jenny? Ah, yes. These days, Grunard is better known as Anthrax Island, and there is good reason for it. During World War II, the British government knew that the Germans were developing biological weapons, and they felt that, well, if they have them, then we should have them too. Uh, just in case, of course, we'll, we'll never use them. No, uh, not unless they use them first, in which case we... We will be using them. And so started the development of biological weapons in Britain. So can you explain what a biological weapon is? Well, in the First World War, chemical weapons had been used by both sides. These contained various noxious gases. Uh, the most common one was mustard gas. But this gas isn't alive. In biological warfare, on the other hand, it weaponizes living biological organisms, like viruses, or in this case, bacteria. Anthrax. Anthrax, indeed. Uh, although, actually, anthrax is the name for the illness that is caused by the bacteria Bacillus anthracis. When ingested or inhaled or even in contact with the skin, this bacteria can be incredibly deadly. But yes, the British government was developing this bacteria into a weapon. But part of development is testing. Right, so like you're saying, the First World War saw large-scale use of chemical warfare and this caused many deaths and a great deal of physical and psychological trauma and mass public outrage. So the Geneva Protocol of the 1920s banned chemical and biological weapons. But when the Second World War commenced in 1939, governments didn't trust each other at all to stand by this pledge. So the UK government actually sent out gas masks to every civilian and strongly advised people to carry them everywhere. Wow. Prime Minister Winston Churchill wrote in a 1944 memo that I quite agree. It may be several weeks or even months before I shall ask you to drench Germany with poison gas. And if we do it, let us do it 100%. In the meanwhile, I want the matter studied in cold blood by sensible people and not by that particular set of psalm-singing, uninformed defeatists which one runs across now here, now there. So obviously Britain didn't drench Germany with poison gas, but they did a significant amount of testing of biological weapons. And this is the mindset towards the testing on Grunard. Yep. And the scientists at Porton Down, which was the government's top secret research lab in England, knew that testing this would be very difficult, what with it being incredibly dangerous and deadly and all of that. So they decided to find somewhere in the deepest, darkest depths of remote Britain, Grunard Island. But Grunard Island is only really dark or deep or remote in the imagination. Maybe it is to someone living in London. But to someone in the town of Ullapool, Grunard is just a stone's throw away. 
Not only that, but there were crofts and smaller towns just across the bay of Grunard Island. I mean, it was a populated place with an established community. Yeah, it's bizarre, you know. Scotland has over 900 islands and only 94 are permanently inhabited. They could have picked a way more remote and secluded island for this experiment. But nope, they picked the one that's surrounded by mainland on three sides and incredibly easy for any old member of the public to access. Well, you're clearly just a Sam singing defeatist, Jenny. (laughs) (laughs) I guess to the minds of the Westminster politicians, they saw Grunard Island as being out of sight and out of mind. Apparently so. But it does make me think of this lovely wee B&B that I've stayed in a few times um, up in Ackleton Bewey, which is only a little bit further north in the west coast than Grunard. The first time I was there, I made this offhand comment about being in the middle of nowhere. And the owner, he got pretty riled up. He said, middle of nowhere? What do you mean, middle of nowhere? You're not nowhere. You're somewhere. This is my home. It's somewhere to me. And you're here, so it's somewhere to you. It's certainly not nowhere. Or else neither of us would be here. (laughs) He certainly put you right in your place, Jenny. Quite literally. (laughs) He did, but I've, I've never forgotten it because he was so right. These places may seem remote and hidden to those who live at the other end of the country. But these are people's homes, their their lives and their livelihoods, and every bit as important as the big cities. Alas, the government scientists don't really care about this, do they? To them, Grunard Island was perfect. Exactly. And so, in the summer of 1942, the scientists got to work. And uh, just a warning here, this does get quite dark. They purchased a flock of 80 sheep and transported them onto Grunard. They then tethered them all to wire that was attached firmly to the ground. Once the sheep were all secure, the island was cleared of all people. Six bombs filled with the deadly anthrax bacteria were detonated on the island and covered the entire landmass in a layer of spores. Oh, this sounds so horrifying. It does, and what happens is even more so. The sheep start dying within days. Not one of the 80 survived. These poor sheep, this is so terrible for them. (laughs) From angry crofters stealing them to the British government anthraxing them, the sheep of Grunard Island have a really, really rough time. They definitely are the forgotten victims in this whole story. But what's more is that all of these tests were filmed. Oh, that's the stuff of nightmares. Mm -hmm. But what's more again is that it was all declassified in 1997. So it can actually be watched online. Although, I will warn you, it is pretty disturbing stuff. Oh, Jenny, you've not been watching this footage, have you? Of course I have, Annie. Oh, it's it's fascinating. It's this juddery, grainy, sepia footage with no sound, which just makes it so eerie. There's ghoulish figures in full, creepy, rubbery hazmat suits just moving around the island, setting it all up. One part just shows these men in full hazmat suits just chasing sheep around the island, trying desperately to tether them down for three and a half minutes. But then it goes on to show the bombs exploding in these brownish clouds and settling slowly all over the ground. And then it gets even darker with the post-experiment dissections of the sheep and the cleaning up of the island. Oh, this just sounds really macabre. It sounds like you're describing a horror or sci-fi film and not something that happened in real life, Mm -hmm. which just makes it even more terrifying. And as we know, these bombs worked. The sheep all died, and then the British government had a highly effective biological weapon at its disposal. Yep, but they did say that it was only ever to be used in retaliation. But that doesn't mean that they didn't have a plan for this. They called it Operation Vegetarian. Their plan was to drop linseed cakes filled with anthrax-causing bacteria into the fields of Germany. But not the battlefields, the agricultural fields. Here, the cows would eat it and go on to become infected with anthrax, and anyone who went on to consume the cow would also be infected, soldier or citizen. This is some pretty heavy stuff, Jenny. It is, and... I think the strangest thing of it all is that they chose to call it Operation Vegetarian. 
this sort of dark humor twist on this horrific plan to kill millions of innocent people. Yes, I think it's it's just a very harrowing and painful history. So there was a Croft interviewed in the 1960s who spoke about when the experiments were happening on Grunard Island and he speaks of a sheep that was washed ashore to the mainland. Now this sheep was eaten by a dog who then ran around the whole farm and was sick all over the land and many of the locals lost their livestock, horse, sheep, cattle but the government quickly paid them to the value of these animals without any quibble. Huh, that almost tells you how much they want everything just to be completely hidden and quiet and kept in the corner of Scotland. But that's actually why the sheep were tethered down to stop this happening. But clearly health and safety wasn't such a big issue back then. But don't worry, Annie, I promise it gets better after the jingle. I'm not sure I believe you, Jenny. (laughs) Let's find out. All right, Jenny, how are you going to cheer me up? Well, after the experiments and the testing was all done, the island was cleared, the military personnel and scientists all left. So that was good. Unfortunately, though, the bacteria spores can remain dormant in the soil for decades. And the scientists knew this. So the island was completely abandoned and huge signs warning people that the island was contaminated were erected. The island was essentially quarantined forever. No one was allowed on it at all. I think it's easier for people to imagine Grunard Island as being out there in the deep ocean, a harsh wee rock breaking waves in the middle of a rough sea with no sight of land or people for miles. But this was a contaminated island, less than a mile away from the mainland. And when you see Grunard Island, it sits in the midst of a bay. The hills of Grunard fit perfectly into the landscape of the mountainous west coast. But as you said, the island was left from this government experiment with signs that read, this is government property. Under experiment, the ground is contaminated with anthrax and dangerous. Landing is prohibited. And after the Second World War, this little island lay quietly contagious for the next 40 years. Ah! That is until it was no longer quietly contagious, but loudly contagious. Because then, in 1981, when everyone had just about forgotten about Grunard Island... What's that? Eco-terrorism! Ah uh, yes, <laughs> this tale has yet another twist. It does, it does. See, in 1981, with the help of locals, a militant group of microbiologists from two Scottish universities sailed to the shore of Grunard Island. Here, they collected 140 kilograms of the topsoil. They then found a way to place a container of this soil on the entrance of Porton Down in Wiltshire, which, if you remember, is the location of the research centre that had orchestrated the whole experiment. In a letter to a newspaper, they called themselves Operation Dark Harvest and claimed to be part of the Scottish Citizens' Army. They demanded that the government decontaminate Grunard Island, or else they'd keep sending packages of deadly soil. And they meant it. Not only did the soil they send actually contain the same virulent strain of anthrax spores, but a few days later, another package of soil was found at the Blackpool Hotel, where the ruling Conservative Party was having its annual conference. They were not messing around. Yes, the Dark Harvest Commandos, as they call themselves, were huge news. And The Guardian reported it in October 1981, in the aftermath of this soil scare, that... The Ministry of Defence last night increased security around Grunard Island, the scene of biological warfare experiments 40 years ago, as police throughout Britain intensified the search for protesters who claimed to have removed 300 pounds of contaminated soil. Now, the same paper got a quote from local hotelier, Mr Selby Florence, who said that... Ach, when I read the papers, I thought I should be dead. People around here seem as healthy as they were this time last week. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> well, the kick from the eco-terrorists worked, and the island was brought back into the government's agenda for the first time in four decades. It wasn't immediate, but plans were drawn up and the island was finally decontaminated in 1986. Government officials removed and incinerated large amounts of the topsoil, and then they mixed formaldehyde, which is a really powerful chemical, with seawater and sprayed the entire island. Forty years on from the initial experiments, another flock of sheep was placed on the island, and Annie, these sheep lived happy and healthy lives. Brilliant. After so much struggle, we have some happy little sheep on this happy little island. I know, it's finally justice for the sheep, Annie. I would rather justice for the crofters than for the sheep, but <laughs> just so you know. But what I would love to know is who, who were these enraged microbiologists and, and what drove them to take such drastic action? Well, the area had been under environmental monitoring for some time, so the microbiologists of the group would know just how dangerous and irresponsible it had been to abandon Grunard Island with nothing but a few signs as warning. Mm. I think it's also a matter of principle and maybe collective psychology. To have Grunard Island as a highly contaminated government experiment, left over, but in full sight of the mainland, it becomes a constant reminder that rural parts of Scotland could be viewed as disposable by the Westminster government. I mean, imagine looking out of your window, or just doing an everyday thing like driving down the road, or visiting the beach, and then seeing, in your local area, an island contaminated by deadly anthrax from the Second World War, left abandoned and toxic. It would leave a scar on the subconscious, and it would change your sense of belonging in a place. I find it genuinely shocking that Grunard was left this way for 40 years. Yes, it's, it's an unbelievable amount of time. But the government did eventually clean it up, and it was declared fit for habitation in 1990 and sold back to the heirs of the original owners for just £500. And will you look at that, Annie? The heir's heir is finally back in his own hands. Well, back in his lungs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jenny, that wasn't improv at all. You've been planning it just for this line. <laughs> Oh, Annie, when we set out to write this episode, I was not expecting it to take such a dark journey through history. Really, Jenny, when you came to me and said, let's do an episode on Anthrax Island, you thought it was going to be happy sheep all the way? Well, I, I, yes, I thought the sheep would be happy. I thought the people would be happy for the majority of the time. I guess the story of Grinard Island shows how much history a small piece of land can hold. And although it's been many interwoven sad tales, I think it's necessary to highlight these darker corners of history so that we can learn from the darkness in the hopes that this kind of thing never happens again. Yeah, you're right. And the darkness in this story so often came from the inequality between those in power and those in place, with the place being Grunard Island and Bay from the ruthless, heartless landlords forcing families off their lands to the government testing a deadly bacteria and then just leaving it for four decades. At least what we did see was the people fighting back to varying degrees of success. But the, the fighting spirit was always there. Even when the crofters were losing everything, they kept fighting. It's a difficult one. I mean, I think, what is Grunard Island now? It is decontaminated, but to some sense, it's still a wasteland. A ruin to ideas of British science exploring cruel ways to kill in 20th century warfare. Mm. When I read stories of Grunard Island, the island itself now feels like a weapon, a, a mark of oppression. It represents how easily forgotten rural areas can be in the big picture of politics, when a government can dare to leave an area toxic for so long. But then, this part of the West Coast is spectacularly beautiful. And when I actually see Grunard Island, I remember that at one point Crofties had dreams to work the land there. That it was a place where people thought that they could make a life. And perhaps the story isn't over for Grunard. 
perhaps there's more to its future than just sheep. This area on the northwest coast of Scotland has a lot of brilliant innovation and great practice in land management going on and diversification, led by community landowning initiatives that put people and communities before profit. So even if Grunard is left to the sheep, the coasts around it are going to prosper. I really hope so, Annie. And we'll be back with more stories from the Scottish waters and coasts next week. Thank you so much for listening to Stories of Scotland. We love making this podcast even when it does lead us to some fairly nightmarish places. I promise we're going to do something more lighthearted for the next episode. It will be my choice. But if you want to help Jenny forget and suppress the memories of the Grunard videos that she's watched, then do leave us a review. It's wonderfully distracting for her. Slangeva. Slangeva. Or the wee old man up there is watering his plants. Sometimes he waves. Oh, maybe you can wave first. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. You wave. <laughs>